Welcome everyone to the second installment of California Wine Institute's Inside California Winemaking. Thank you all for taking the time out to be with us today. In this webinar series, produced specifically for our key Asian markets, wine writer and educator Elaine Chacon Brown will speak with top California producers, bringing a bit of the vineyards and the cellars of the Golden State to our international audience. We've scheduled these webinars to best suit your time zones in the hopes that th this hour in the day suits your schedules. The guest vintners featured in this series have also been selected with you, our audience, in mind to bring you insights about wineries and wines that are present in your markets. Today we have the privilege to welcome Michael Eddy of Lewis M. Martini Winery. Before we get started, some housekeeping reminders for everyone. First, please ensure you have your Zoom screen set to speaker view. There should be an option to select it in the top right corner of your screen. During the webinar, note that there are two communication methods available to participants that we encourage you to use, a chat section as well as a Q&A section. These are different. The chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other participants, so just be sure to select everyone in the to field as it can default to panelists only. And then there's the Q&A section, and this is where we'd like you to submit your questions for Elaine and Michael to answer towards the end of the webinar. We will do our best to address your questions, but please know any that are not answered live will be provided in the Q&A summary in the email you will receive following the program. In this email, we will also provide a list of export markets for the wineries represented. Now I'd like to introduce our host, Elaine, in addition to writing for her own site, Waka Waka Wine Reviews, she serves as the American Specialist for JancisRobinson.com and is contributing writer to Wine and Spirits magazine and contributes to a long list of respected publications. She contributed to the eighth edition of the World Atlas of Wine, which has won multiple awards very recently, as well as the award-winning fourth edition of the Oxford Companion to Wine. And Michael. Michael Eddy actually got into winemaking after a stint of brewing beer at home. Prior to joining Martini in 2005, Michael's background in winemaking included positions at Trefethen Family Vineyards, Beaulieu Vineyard, and Rodney Strong Vineyards. Michael has flourished as a Cabernet Sauvignon craftsman, and Martini wines have been consistently praised by some of the world's most recognized critics. Now, Elaine, I'll turn it over to you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Inside California Winemaking. We are so thrilled to bring this week's episode to you. Um, we have a special guest. Michael Eady is here from Louis Martini Winery, and I'm quite thrilled to bring him to this audience. As many of you know, this series, Inside California Winemaking, was developed especially for markets across Asia. We feel it's very important and quite an honor to bring California to you through this special webinar series. And so this series has des been designed to serve times and show winemakers and producers, especially for your markets. It is quite an honor to have Michael Eady, one of California's renowned winemaking talents with us today. And also quite an honor to showcase Louis Martini Winery with three uh, Cabernet Sauvignons from their portfolio. Louis Martini is Californ one of California's great historic wineries, and Michael will be sharing his work with us for Louis Martini today. Michael, thank you so much for being here. Um, thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for having me. It's, um, it's an honor. I, I'm really especially um, excited to talk about Martini with you today. You have had a long standing um, relationship with the wines of Louis Martini who've been wow. working with it for over a decade. And it's really quite a special place. There's a, a very unique history there. And so I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about the history of Martini just to get us started. Yeah, um, you know, it's actually a great story. And <clears throat> it's interesting when I got out of, uh, got my master's degree from UC Davis, I got out and never suspected that working for a winery with a long heritage would mean that much to me on a personal level. Um, but my first winery was Beaulieu Vineyard, which mm -hmm. was founded in the 30s, as was Martini. And I learned then that being connected to a story and some history gave more depth to what I did on a daily basis. It gave meaning and a connection. Um, 
it may not have informed the wines that I was making per se, but <clears throat> it really added some depth to the experience. Um, and so my experience with Martini has been fantastic. And as you mentioned, <clears throat> the story is really incredible. And uh, to me, one of the great things about it is that the story of Louis M. Martini, our founder, really is one example of what in our country would refer to as the American dream. And I don't know that all the attendees uh, know this concept, but this is the idea. So, Go ahead. Let me interject for a minute. And I'm going to ask us to slow down just a bit because the, it's such a good story. And I know that you get excited when you talk about it. And I so told I just, you I'd talk fast. <laughs> well, and so I just want to <laughs> ask us to slow down so everyone can, um, can hear the story with us. But while you talk about that, um, I wonder if Katie might be able to also show the photo of the Martini family. Yeah. That would be great. Um, we did have a little bit of internet trouble, but I think it's working now. There we go. And I, I'm so grateful to um, the team at Martini for sharing this photo with you. So if you could still excitedly, but slowly <laughs> tell us about the family members here in this photo. Yeah, so the gentleman in the middle is Louis M. Martini, who is our founder. And I mentioned this American dream idea, which is still, while that we know that there are people who struggle to uh, achieve it still, and there's work to be done, I still think it's part of the backbone of the United States of America. And it's this idea that you can have a vision for your life and through hard work, pursue your dreams and achieve them. And Louis M. is a great example of this. Uh, his father was a fisherman. He came from Genoa, Italy. And his father came over to the United States, uh, to the San Francisco Bay Area in, on the coast of Northern California. And there he started a fishing business and there was a, a thriving Italian American community. And eventually he wanted some help. So he called for his son, Louis M, to come join him. And at around the age of 13 years old, Louis M by himself took a boat across the Atlantic, and then hopped on a train all the way across the United States. You which said is, at what, what age again? It, I think it was around 13. Yeah, which is amazing. 13-year-old uh, yes. across the, the world by himself. Yes. Yeah, these days, we can't imagine a 13-year-old making a trek like that on their own. And um, so and he came was across... was around when again? This would have been in the late 1800s. Um, and he joined his father and started helping him out with the fishing business. And the, the community there, the, or the Italian-American community, was, was fairly tight-knit. And they operated traditionally off of a barter system where they would trade a lot of goods. And so the, the family, with their leftover fish, because refrigeration wasn't available at the time, would make cioppino, which is now a fairly famous fish stew or soup. Um, and they would trade that to the, the bread maker, to the butcher, and they would trade for goods. And as the story goes, at one point, they were able to trade fish for some wine grapes. Mm -hmm. And Louis M. decided to try to make some wine. And we all recognized that it was probably not fantastic wine, <laughs> um, given that it was his first venture. My first venture was certainly not great wine. Um, but it was enough to excite that passion uh, and that interest in him. And he decided that was really the, the path he wanted to pursue, not just to follow the path of his father. So he eventually went back to Italy to get some, one, to get better English skills, but uh, also to, um, to get more technical training on winemaking. And he ended up making wine in several parts of the state of California, but ultimately landed in the middle of Napa Valley in St. Helena, where we are today, and built his winery in 1933, uh, right when we were coming out of Prohibition. Right, which is, again, really, really remarkable. I mean, it's, there's so much vision and foresight in that story, you know, yes. to, to realize he wants to make wine at a time people aren't making wine. Right. We're in Prohibition in the United States. Yep. And then even though we're in prohibition and not allowed to make wine, he goes back to Italy to learn more about how to do it and then comes back and create and builds the winery as soon as prohibition is done. Exactly. Yes. Um, and I, I always have to remind people, I think most people can guess this if they think about it, but in 1933, Napa Valley was not one of the capitals of, wor of world-renowned wines. Right. It was just agricultural community. In fact, 
much of what was planted were uh, vegetables, row crops, um, orchards were very common. Um, and there just weren't that many vineyards, and certainly not as many as there are today. Um, so I often say that to me, Louis M. must have had a, an interesting combination of vision and luck. Right. Um, right. He could see the potential, but he certainly couldn't have imagined that Napa Valley would become one of the world's greatest centers for Cabernet Sauvignon. So let's um, go ahead and just, we'll keep talking about the family, but I want to go ahead and orient our audience to where we're talking about. Great. Napa Valley, of course, is famous, but Katie, if we could go ahead and um, pull up the maps and we'll come back to some photos. But if we can go ahead and, so here's a broad California map, and you'll notice that Katie has put a box around the area of California that we're going to focus on today. What's really important to notice here is that, of course, on the left, that is the Pacific Ocean, which has an profoundly strong influence on all of the growing regions that we'll be talking about today. But also notice that within the box, the area that we'll discuss, the San Francisco San Pablo Bay complex actually plays a significant influence as well. So if we could look at the next screen. This is a focus, so this is a closer up view of the area within that same box in the last map. So again, there's the Pacific Ocean on the left you'll see the San Francisco Bay, San Pablo Bay complex comes right up to both Napa Valley and Sonoma Valley there at the bottom. Um, and so um, you mentioned that Louis Martini Winery is there in St. Helena. Katie, if you could circle that with the, that's great. Yep, there's a pin right there. Right, and so you said, Michael, that that's where um, Louis M. Martini really established himself in the winery. Yes, and almost smack dab yeah, I think you can see pretty clearly Napa Valley is the browner area there. So he's almost smack dab in the middle of Napa Valley, um, the valley itself, not just the viticultural area. Right. Um, and so he had a lot of success. He actually was a pioneer. I think he was a relatively scrappy individual, which probably is impossible to translate. So no one knows what I'm saying, but he has, um, a, he has a, he gave, a, took a, made a lot of effort to accomplish he, his goals. A lot of effort, but was also uh, acutely aware of opportunities. Yes. He could see opportunities and seize them. And in fact, one of the vineyards um, that is on the map here, Monterosso, which is actually in Sonoma County, uh, he was able to purchase only five years after he built his winery. Thank you, yeah, it's terrible. right there. Well, and that vineyard, as you know, Elaine, has become one of the most famous vineyards in the state of California right. now today. And we actually have a photo, um, but what, before we move to the photo, what I'd like to point out, um, sorry, Katie, is actually notice that Monterosso is in the mountains. So it's actually in what we call the Mayacamas Mountains. And that is in Sonoma Valley, relatively south in Sonoma County. So the yellow outline is Sonoma County. And the green outline inside the yellow is Sonoma Valley Appalachian. And Monterosso is within, in the mountains within what we call the Sonoma Valley Aviation, um, Appalachian. That's important because notice the proximity to the bay does quite a lot to cool down the Sonoma Valley area and especially the Monterosso area. But Katie, could you show us the photo of Monterosso? As My Michael said, it's incredibly special site. It has some of the oldest vines in California, and it's one of the oldest vineyards in California as well. So this is a view of Monterosso. Can you tell us more about what we're seeing here, Michael? Yeah, so Monterosso sits at roughly a thousand feet elevation above Sonoma Valley. So several um, hundred meters. Thank you, if you say so. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, it has uh, Zinfandel vines that were planted roughly 127 years ago. Um, and we believe there's one block of Semillon that we believe is the oldest in the country and possibly the oldest in the world. So I actually uh, researched this. Okay. I researched this. So the Semillon at Monterosso is the oldest Semillon in North America. Okay. And it is among the oldest in the world. But the oldest Semillon is actually in Australia. Australia. Okay, that, yes. that would be another great guess because they yes. produce some amazing semions. I, I knew we would be talking about that. And so I looked it up. I, I contacted people all over the world <laughs> to figure it out. Yeah. And 
we should get off this slide because literally I could use the rest of the time to talk about Monterosso. It is, it is that special a vineyard. Quite frankly, it's a special place. Um, but I think the point for today is that Louis M could see the potential there. And the family always had an attraction to mountain or hillside vineyards and red wines in particular. And so that really brings us to where we are today, where we make a number of different varieties of wines, but our focus is really Cabernet Sauvignon. We make uh, nine different Cabernets right now. <clears throat> and well, and in the next few years, we'll get to 12, 11 or 12 um, as we create some new ones. So as we keep talking about this, let's go ahead and start looking at these wines. Um, the Monterosso that you just that we just showed plays a small role in the first wine, which is the Sonoma County Cabernet. Correct. But there's another really important and beautiful vineyard, Borelli Creek, that plays an even larger role. So could we go ahead and see a photo of that vineyard? Yeah, and so as we looked at the map, Elaine, you pointed out that the bay provides the cooling influence uh, to Napa Valley and Sonoma Valley and Sonoma County in general. And as you move further away, more northerly from that, you get warmer and warmer weather. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so you can see where the Alexander Valley AVA is. And the Sonoma County Cabernet that we're tasting today, there is some from Monterosso, but much of it is from the Alexander Valley and then the Dry Creek Valley, which is just to the southwest of that. Right. Um, Borelli Creek, which we just showed a photo of, is in Alexander Valley. Yeah, it would actually be. Yeah, you can see it. It's labeled there on the map. Um, Katie, it's up to the far left. It's labeled, but if you could just highlight it. Yeah, yeah. So, so quite a ways from the Bay Influence, so a much warmer site. Um, but really the Sonoma County, while the vineyards are important, uh, much of the influence on the Sonoma County is in the winemaking side, in the winery. Um, hopefully most attendees understand that there are significant influences from the growing site where the vines are grown and the season or the climate. Um, but there also is much that we can do in the winery that affects the style of the wine. And this wine, so, so in the United States at least, wine is getting to be drunk more and more commonly as a cocktail, so not always with food. And so our goal with the Sonoma County is to craft a wine that has the depth and the intensity of Cabernet Sauvignon, the weight, but without a lot of astringency or tannin. So it's relatively polished and drinkable on its own. Still goes with food, um, but we also want to capture the real youthful primary character of Cabernet Sauvignon. And I think in this wine that comes across as a very black cherry. Um, but really what we're doing is, is being very thoughtful with the extraction of this wine. So when we're pulling out the color, the tannin and the flavor, we don't want to get too much of that tannin and structure so that the wine maintains this roundness because then we are also going to age it in tanks. This wine is not aged in barrels aged in tanks and what that does because there's no oxygen exposure is really preserves that fresh vibrant youthful fruit well, However, we, tasting ahead. the wine that's the thing that really stands out to me it's it's so clearly cabernet and it has all the pleasure and kind of i think of cabernet as a very upright wine it's mm -hmm. you know there's this kind of upright structure you know cabernet has a lot of fortitude or strength but this wine, there's, there's just like pleasing round fruit, still with the structure, incredibly long finish, but yes. very, very fresh tasting. Mm -hmm. And so it's more fresh berries, brambly, on the bush berries. And, but the really thing, the thing that I find incredible about this wine is the value. You know, mm -hmm. one of the things I admire about Martini, it is a longstanding winery, as we've been talking about, but even more the ability for martini to consistently over deliver quality for the price that you're paying is really remarkable. And I feel that this Sonoma County Cabernet is such a good example of that. You know, yes. you're, you're going to get a really pleasant Cabernet at an incredible price. And that that's true, you know, in every market it, that it appears. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, with a lot of Cabernets and I respect many of those Cabernets, in fact, we make some, 
uh, they really scream for protein and fat, right? They want right. some meat because of all that tannin. But I think what we're, you know, what I'm trying to strike as a balance in this wine is that accessibility, it can be drunk on its own pleasurably because there isn't this lingering dryness. Mm -hmm. However, it still has enough acidity and weight and structure that it will go with food. So uh, this is our entry level. So lowest price Cabernet Sauvignon that we make here in the States. Um, and the most broadly distributed, but but a very different take on on Cabernet. And you know, when when we're making nine different Cabernet Sauvignons, clearly each one has a purpose. Um, and I think that is part of mastery is being able to express your medium in many different personalities. Mm -hmm. um, and in <clears throat> fact, we make a rosé out of Cabernet Sauvignon, which is not terribly common. Uh, it's no, probably it, the most distinct wine Cabernet that we make. It's so, it's really uncommon to find Cabernet Rosé, but it's really one of the most beautiful expressions of Cabernet. It, I, I really it quite is. like it as a Rosé. Um, so let's go ahead and look at the Alexander Valley um, as well, because they are both Sonoma County, but the two wines side by side show how diverse the county is as well, and also capture the diversity in the, in the wines as you were just discussing. So, yeah. so the first wine comes from multiple Appalachians or AVAs in Sonoma County, but this wine is entirely from Alexander Valley and quite a lot from Borelli Creek as well. Is that right? Correct. And uh, Katie, whereas... Can you see the photo of Borelli Creek again too? And whereas the, the Sonoma County would be coming from dozens and dozens and dozens of blocks from vineyards, uh, the Alexander Valley is usually three or four individual blocks, so much more specific sites. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, you know, keeping on this winemaking piece, as we move to the next two wines, it, these are made very differently from the Sonoma County. These are going to be on the skins longer, so we're going to build more structure into the wine, more tannin. Um, but then we're also going to age it in barrels rather than tanks. And the barrels give that oxygen exposure that allows the softening of the mouthfeel, but also develops these layers to the wine. You get some aged nuance. Um, the, the fruit will shift more from really fresh that you get in the Sonoma County to more complex, maybe almost dried, at least with a fair amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, what really, the, the hallmark of, of this wine, the Alexander Valley, is what you said in the Sonoma County, there's brambles. To me, this one just screams brambles. In fact, maybe even blackberry leaf, but it's that blackberry. Yes. Um, and it has an herbal tone to it. Well, I was uh, going to say it, it smells like California forest. Yes. You know, where there's a little bit of bay, a little bit of dry earth, a little bit of dry grass, that real mix of California forest. Yeah. Um, and, but and also, in fact, in cooler vintages, that... <laughs> that uh, Forest can be almost sage leaf. It can be a very mm -hmm. fresh I, herb. Uh -huh. um, and to me, that's the hallmark of Alexander Valley. In yes. addition to the fact that the structure of the wine is the most rustic, which I don't know translates very well. So I think it's better to say unrefined. Well, I uh, would say, you know, just feeling the, mouth, the wine in the mouth. To me, it feels like raw silk. You know, so if you think about fabrics and raw yep. silk is still silky and smooth, but has a little, prrr, just a little bit of texture exactly. to it. And mm -hmm. for me, this wine ha feels, feels like that. So there's a little more texture to the tannin, a little more texture to the mouthfeel, but it's still quite smooth and pleasing at the same time. Yes. Yeah, and that, that year in and year out is really the greatest fingerprint of this Alexander Valley wine. And mm -hmm. some of that is created by those warmer temperatures because we're further away from the bay. In addition to the fact that some of the blocks that this wine comes from are very high in gravel and cobble. Uh, so the vines really struggle uh, and that gives us very small berries, great light exposure on the fruit. So you get this tannin development. Um, and when this wine is young, it can be quite firm, uh, frankly, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, it does have that rough kind of rustic, unrefined quality. And I, well, and I, I happen love to love it. I would love this with a um, juicier steak, more like ribeye. Yes. You know, a little bit more fat to the, to exactly. the meat. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's go ahead and could we look back at the family photo again too? I want to yeah. make sure that we talk about 
the martinis a little bit more as before we go into speaking about the Napa Valley wine. And the reason for that is, I think, quite special. We've talked about what a visionary Louis M. Martini there in the middle was. And his son, Louis, Louis P. Martini, really kind of took it to the next, took Martini to the next level helped, you know, really um, expand it a little, uh, make it even more stable and successful as a business. But then Mike Martini comes in and he's a third generation visionary again, and really a creative thinker. And what I think is incredibly important to point out is that the Martini family and the Gallo family actually knew each other quite well. Gallo um, becomes a part of the Martini program in 2002 and Mike stays on. And I, I, and actually, and all the way into 2015. And I think if you could speak about that a little bit, because I, what I want to emphasize there is the continuity that the Martini family establishes Louis Martini, but, and then Gallo comes in. And my understanding is Mike um, was really more readily able to, to expand and fulfill his vision for Martini by working with Gallo for as long as he did. Could you, could you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, um, real quick, I want to say something about Louis P, just so he doesn't get yes, left out. Yeah. Because Louis P uh, was kind of a quiet one. He's often described as the gentle giant. He was a very large man, but very relatively soft-spoken and just a kind of a kind-hearted, gentle man. But he was also the most technical, probably, of the three mm -hmm, men. Mm -hmm. he, he made some real innovations, both in the vineyard and the winery. Um, and then his son, Mike Martini, was university trained, so very technically knowledgeable, but much more of an artisan, um, more like his grandfather in terms of vision, um, but an artistic vision, um, not so much an opportunistic vision. And uh, what Mike really wanted to do is have the vision and craft the wines and what the partnership between Gallo and Martini brought was Gallo was able to provide capital money yes. to invest into the winery, to bring it up to a much more state of the art, give Mike the tools that he wanted to do what he wanted to do with the wines. Um, and an interesting little note also is that these, these two wineries, these two families had a connection really from the start of their wineries because mm -hmm. Um, in the United States, when you go to create a winery, you have to register with the government and you get what's called a bond. You become a bonded winery. Which means you're le it just means you're legal. It means you're legal, yes. Yeah. And, that, and that you uh, have to pay taxes on that wine once you go to sell it. But the bonded winery number assigned to Gallo was the one directly after Louis Martini. Wow. So wow. Yeah. they applied for their bond almost at the same time. Um, so they really were conceptually connected for a very long time. And Gallo came in and, and asked Mike, uh, what do you need? Joe Gallo actually asked Mike, the head of the company, what do you need to make the best Napa cab you can make? Um, and the investments led to the micro winery uh, being developed where we now make our small lot wines and where we make our lot one, which is our flagship Napa Valley Cabernet. Mm -hmm. um, so that partnership was, was really critical. And that, that is why Mike stayed around so long because he finally had the resources to carry out his vision. Um, and it was only a handful of years after that, that uh, he and I first met and started working together on the Sonoma County specifically that uh, we tasted first. Well, and you actually, you were able to work with Mike for at least a decade. From what, yes, what I recall. correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which, and so again, that continuity piece of, um, you know, Gallo comes in and helps kind of fulfill Mike's vision for the winery. And then you come in and are able to work with him and really understand how he conceives of winemaking and how he yes. wants to use that winery that Gallo helped build. And, and so now in a way, you're really continuing that, that vision, that, that Mike helped establish and, and that now you and Gallo are growing with Martini. Correct. And continuing to evolve off of that. So as we've grown the portfolio, I mentioned we have new Cabernet Sauvignons coming out over the next few years is really taking that foundation and then kind of expanding it out and evolving it. Um, well, and I'm, off I'm so excited about the mountain Cabernet projects that you've been working on. The, the wines are really quite delicious and really, again, just like these three wines that we're talking through show, you know, the last one we were saying, it's such an Alexander Valley tasting wine. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, and we'll talk about 
Napa Valley tasting wine as well. Um, you know, the mountain wines similarly, they really express their, their place in a beautiful way. So could we go ahead and look at, let's go ahead and start talking about Napa Valley. Yep. Um, I'm having a little bit of light trouble. It's getting dark in here. I'm going to, sorry, the sun, we're in a different place of uh, time of day. And so the sun is setting as we're talking about. about well, it. I'm having different light trouble. I'm just getting yeah. more, more yellow as the uh, sun goes down. Well, and, and so apologies to everyone watching, but you're getting to see it live as it happens. Now, you know, it really, <laughs> it's real, but so let's go ahead and um, actually, Katie, if we could briefly go back to the, the Google Maps um, view. What I'd like to highlight here is if you look in closely, you can see again, the yellow outline is the outline for Sonoma County. The red outline is the outline for Napa Valley. And where the two overlap in the middle is the Mayacamas range. And so you'll see my, uh, Monterosso is in the Mayacamas range, but on the Sonoma side. And then you can see there's a valley down the middle as Michael pointed out earlier, where Louis Martini Winery is located is r right in the valley itself. And then on the eastern side of the valley is another mountain range, and we call that the Vaca Range. And so the next wine that we're going to be talking about includes fruit from a very special vineyard, again, another Hallmark California vineyard. Um, and we have a photo of that. It's called Stagecoach. If you could tell us more about, about this site and what makes it special. So this is Stagecoach Vineyard. Yeah, so Stagecoach we actually have been working with uh, since 2003, which was the first vintage of our Lot 1 Cabernet, um, and portions of it that don't make it into um, the Lot 1 will make it into the Napa Valley that we're moving on to. But it's a truly remarkable vineyard. It's hard to appreciate from this photo but it sits up in these mountains above Napa Valley, which you can see in the distance, mm -hmm. kind of in the, the back right of the photo there. Um, and all I can say is that when you go to this vineyard, you do not feel like you're in Napa Valley anymore. Yeah. Have you been there, Elaine? Have you been yes, up there? It, yes, yeah. and it's, it's a beautiful site. And, you know, we've even seen not only hawks flying through, but actually eagles flying through, yeah. which is a rare sight in California and, and really speaks to the remoteness of this vineyard. Right to me, in Napa it, Valley, but remote enough to have eagles. And, and very rocky. There are literally like pyramids of rock that the, fe that the developer, Jan Krupp, pulled out of the ground. I've walked through blocks where you can't imagine how a grapevine is growing. And uh, he even used dynamite to displace mm -hmm. rocks in spots so that he could plant the vines. Mm -hmm. um, to me, it almost feels like you're in northern Mexico or you know southern california or something like that it's just a very rugged terrain very arid um but beautiful as well and it doesn't doesn't feel like you're in napa valley well and um, vo really volcanic rock and soils right correct yes well um, in tasting this wine the that there's such a difference in texture to the um the alexander valley i was describing it as kind of cords of raw silk this feels um finer grained and mm -hmm. almost powdery fine. Like there's yes. plenty of tannin, but it almost melts and spreads through the mouth. There's a powdery fine element to it. Um, it's really, uh, it feels like Mountain Cabernet, but very elegant, refined Mountain Cabernet. Yes. And it's worth noting that in the winemaking, I kind of talked about the winemaking of the Alexander Valley Cabernet. The Napa Valley is really made in a very similar fashion. Um, there are some subtle differences in the percentage of new oak, not big, um, but in terms of extraction and aging, which they're both aged for roughly a year and a half in barrel, there's a lot of the winemaking is similar. You can see we include some other varieties that were not in the Alexander Valley, and I can touch on that in a second, but, but what that means is that when you taste these wines side by side, most of what you are tasting, if you have the same vintage, which we do today, is derived from the growing region. And to me, the Napa Valley is very classic Napa Valley Cabernet, meaning it has that weight and structure, but it has a polish or refinement to it that gives that what you're calling more powdery kind of, um, kind of fine texture. Uh, and also the fruit profile, rather than being that kind of brambly wild berry character, to me is moving more towards that classic cassis 
Um, yes, it's it's yes. a very, very dark, very cassis driven, which, which is really expressive of Napa Valley Cabernet as well. Exactly. It is kind of the quintessential classic descriptor. A lot of people don't know what cassis actually tastes like. I encourage people to at least go out and buy some cassis syrup. It gives mm -hmm. you a, a decent proxy. It's, it's syrup, but still. Um, but cassis has this very dark fruit, but also this almost medicinal herbal undertone mm -hmm. uh, that gives the fruit a, a complexity in and of itself. And, and then, of course, without, you get the oak. Without much sweetness, too. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, um, so to me, that's, that's really, this wine really defines who we are, right? We are in the middle of Napa Valley. We focus on Cabernet Sauvignon. And so this wine is a very important expression of our history and heritage. Well, and so speak to us about the choice that you just mentioned. The Alexander Valley has a little bit of Merlot from what I recall, well, whereas the Napa Valley actually has several other varieties mixed in. So what is, what is the reason for one having a number of varieties and one just a, just a few? Well, what you saw were a couple of varieties on the Napa, Petit Syrah and Petit Verdot that, that we leverage um, pretty heavily. Mm -hmm. And uh, those varieties are both very, very dark fruited and fairly structured. So we use those to help provide density to the wine, um, but also shift that more towards that truly inky dark fruit. Um, almost, a, well, the cassis, certainly some blackberry, but even maybe a very, very dark plum, like a damson uh, dessert plum. And so those, those varieties are very, very important for helping to achieve that style. And that's, mm -hmm. the percentages will vary, but the inclusion of those varieties for that purpose is very, very typical of this wine. So one of the questions that we have um, coming into is very simply about alcohol levels. And so I was hoping that you could talk to us about um, how different regions and vineyards seem to demand different um, ripeness or alcohol levels, but also how does, how do those differences impact the way that the mouth feels and the way the wine feels in the mouth? It's a great question. And uh, it's a, a slight pet peeve of mine. So I'll try not to be too dramatic about it. But uh, what, what is often said is that alcohol will give heat or aggressiveness to the wine. And I and don't, that, I don't get heat on these wines. So correct. Do, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and in fact, we have wines in our portfolio Cabernets that are well over 15% alcohol. And when I taste them with groups, I often ask them guess the alcohol on it. And most of them will guess, some guess under 14, but usually they'll say 14.2, something right, like that. Right. They're off by more than a percent. Mm -hmm. The reality is, is that alcohol is just one component of the wine and it needs to be in balance with the other components, i.e. we need to have the fruit concentration, we need to have the weight of the palate. But balance is that. If you have a lot of one thing, you need to have a lot of another yes. thing. Mm -hmm. And so... Wines become hot and aggressive from alcohol when they're deficient in those other things. However, alcohol also fundamentally provides a sense of sweetness on the front palate. And it's very different than the sweetness we would get from residual sugar because residual sugar gives a cloying, heavy finish, whereas alcohol gives you this fruit sweet on the front that then dissipates. Right. Um, and if anybody drinks, you know, certainly spirits like bourbon, th there's oak in there that gives some vanilla sweetness to it, but the alcohol itself has a sense of sweetness on the front palate. But it's just a, an experience of sweetness rather than an actual literal sugar sweetness. Correct. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. Yes. Mm -hmm. the, the Alexander Valley and the Napa Valley are dry. There's a little bit of residual sugar in the Sonoma County, very, very small amount. It helps mm -hmm. round out that mouthfeel. Yes. Uh -huh. um, but so what I argue is that a lot of the style of California wines, which is these riper, more unctuous, sweet, sweet, not sugar sweet, but sweet fruit, is due to the alcohol level. Um, and what you would find is if you reduced the alcohol level, you would have wines that were much leaner, the, ac the acidity would show through more prevalently, um, and the wines would seem more linear, more firm, quite mm -hmm. frankly, more old world. Um, I do think that is one of the big differences between old world Cabernets and California Cabernets is it, there are other things as well, but the alcohol is an important part of it because it gives that mouth filling sweetness, especially in the front of the palate. Well, in some, some vineyards, what I've seen just from 
a lot of tasting is that some vineyards, the acidity level can be so high that if you pick earlier to have the alcohol level be lower, the acid can actually be uncomfortable in the mouth. It's, Correct. It seems that some vineyards grow in a way that you need to allow the fruit to stay on the vine just a little longer so that the acid and the alcohol be, come into balance, as you were saying. Correct. And, and in addition, when you pick at those lower sugars, you are going to have fruit composition what's gonna, that is going to give you more green uh, vegetal characters, not the desirable herbaceous undertone of Cabernet Sauvignon, but, but direct green vegetal characters, which is undesirable for the wines that I'm making. Mm-hmm. Um, so there, there are a lot of downsides to picking too early. Too, it's too a different early. style. And, right. and some people like that, um, but it's, it's definitely not typical of California. So in the work that you're doing, you're getting to work with Cabernet from vineyards all over the north coast of California. So that would include um, Napa County, Sonoma County, of course, but also um, Martini um, Winery was exploring parts of Lake County. And Correct. so as you've, and, and as you were saying, you're expanding the different Cabernets that Martini is bottling and have a host of mountain specific Cabernets that, that Martini's focusing on as well. So as you've worked with so many different vineyards, for Cabernet from so many different parts of the north, north coast of California. Tell us, some, what have you learned about California from doing that? Well, it's, it's very diverse, first of all. Um, I'm not a soils guy. I, you know, I took geology as an undergraduate in college, so I know a little bit. Um, but the soils just in Napa Valley alone are extraordinarily diverse. Uh, and then you get into the climatic pockets, you you know, as we mentioned, even going from southern Napa Valley at the town of Napa and moving north, you are going to get colder springs, winter springs, and you're going to get much warmer summers. And that has a dramatic influence on the flavor and aroma compound development in those young uh, grape berries and in the growth of the canopy. So um, California is just extraordinarily diverse. And we actually make some wine from a vineyard in Lake County called uh, Snow's Lake that the Martini family helped to develop. Um, and there were, when we acquired that vineyard, uh, let's see, that's been seven years ago, seven, eight years ago. Uh, there were still a couple of blocks there that the Martini family had originally planted. So it's pretty cool to see that kind of full circle mm-hmm. um, of where the family's been and returning to that. Mm-hmm. and. Honestly, I, I, uh, I don't, well, a lot of people probably aren't aware, but we renovated our tasting room, our hospitality center and reopened, um, early last year. There in St. Helena. Yeah. Really such a special building. The, the renovation is incredible. It's, it's really one of the most beautiful buildings in Napa Valley now. Yes. We're, we're super proud of it because we think we've mm-hmm. captured the feel of the original mm-hmm. building, but also kind of brought it a little bit of a modern touch. Um, but a few months after we did that, we were able to host the uh, Napa Valley wine auction, mm-hmm. which is uh, put together by the Napa Valley Vineyard Association and, or the Napa Valley Vintners. And Louis M. Martini was one of the founders of that group. So it's another one of those kind of full yes, circle full experiences, circle. right? Is coming back. Um, so that, those are, as I mentioned, the things that kind of bring more depth of meaning to what I do on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, no, it's, it's really, for me, especially, it's just really moving to have those historic connections, you know, um, and to feel as if we're getting to make contact with the founders of one of the world's great regions in that way. And Mm -hmm. so we're almost out of time, but one of the things that we have to talk about is the ageability of martini wines. I actually last summer was able to enjoy a 1965 um, Cabernet from Martini and it was incredibly drinkable. It was beautiful wine. And, and, you know, one of the longstanding stories of uh, Martini, if you speak with winemakers that have been in California for a long time, they'll talk about, Oh yes, I enjoyed, you know, Martini from 1940s and, you know, and there's all these stories about older vintage wines. And so can you tell us just briefly a little bit about your experience with older vintages of Martini wines and how, how these wines that you make today um, we can expect to age? 
Yeah, well, first of all, I think it's worth saying that uh, aged, you know, significantly bottle aged Cabernet Sauvignon is a taste that some people have and some mm -hmm. people don't. The reality is, is that a lot of Americans, at least, still like to drink wines very young, and that's okay. But uh, I will say when we go back and do verticals of the Sonoma County Cabernet, which is not a wine we're intending to age, that wine holds up beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, it, it ages actually very well, even for decade plus easy. Um, but the wines that I think of in our portfolio that really have ageability, um, Monterosso, we touched on earlier, the Cabernet Alpha Monterosso just has the innate guts for or structure innards for aging. It has high acidity because it's a relatively cool site. It has lots of tannin because it's a, a mountain site. Um, and it also has this innate complexity that just gets amplified as the wines age. So that wine is a stellar wine for aging, many decades. Um, I haven't tasted really, really old Monterosso because that fruit wasn't always put into right. single vineyard wines. It was often just bottled as a Sonoma wine or just a martini wine, even. Yeah, Ma yes. Mountain Cabernet. Yes, uh, yes. For a long time, they were called mm -hmm. Mountain Cabernets. Um, but I was, my first winery out of school at Beaulieu Vineyard was able to taste Cabernets from the 50s and actually tasted a few other varieties from the 40s. And so I can tell you that, I will say also that I think the wine composition and the vineyards have mm -hmm. changed dramatically from the fifties mm -hmm. to now how we make the wine, how we grow the grapes is very, very different, like almost night and day, but there is still something about that variety and that location that builds this structure that is able to age mm -hmm. quite well. Um, our Napa Valley ages beautifully. The Alexander Valley certainly has plenty of tannin um, and it has that herbal fruit, you know, counterpoint that really gives it that interest as it ages. Mm -hmm. um, and our lot one, we began making in 2003, which was our first vintage. Um, but I'm amazed every time I do a vertical of that wine at how well those initial vintages are holding up. Because again, it was a new project. We, we had a vision, yes, Mike had so a vision, but we were saying, well, I think this is what we want to do based off of where I think we're headed. Um, and you make tweaks every year, right? You, you evolve and you try to get closer and closer to what you believe is perfect. And, um, but that wine has aged remarkably well. Yes, and been received very well uh, too. Yes. Um, so we are actually out of time, but before we go, I wanna be sure to let you know, you've gotten a few personal hellos and thank yous um, from viewers in Mongolia, Singapore, Japan, China, Hong Kong, and also in California. Yes, so, and I, I will say I saw a few of them, but I'm trying to talk and listen yes. to, so I'm very yeah. sorry if I didn't respond. Um, I think I got a couple of you, but um, trying to multitask, so yes. thank you. It's, I'm really happy that you are all able to join, and uh, it's very cool that we have this platform to be able to connect across the globe. Very, very cool. Um, many of my... Um, very favorite wine trips and my most gracious hosts have been in some of the countries that are watching today. And so I'm, I'm really quite grateful to be able to um, share a little bit of California with all of you and especially do so with Michael Eady and Louis Martini Wines. It's really quite an honor to be invited into your day in this way. So thank you to all of you who've taken the time to be with us. And thank you very much, Michael, for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. I appreciate Great. it. Great. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and thank you to all our attendees. A reminder that a recording of today's webinar will be published to the California Wine Institute's YouTube channel in the next couple of days. All participants will receive an email with the link. And we also hope that you will join us in two weeks time for the next episode of Inside California Winemaking featuring Chantal Fortham, of Flowers Winery in Sonoma. The webinar will take place next Thursday, June 25th. Thank you all again. Be before we go, I want to quickly mention you've now received additional thank yous from Philippines and Taiwan. So thank ah, you to thank all you. of you. Yes. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. <laughs>